the return of the blind basement. This amp, along with uh, three or four others, belonged to one client who lives just outside of Nashville. And he was going to come pick up all these amps at once, and his schedule didn't allow for when my schedule did on weekends and stuff. That was an initial delay. And the original plan for these amps was to uh, use it with, uh, first try to SIR load, reactor, reactive load, and that wasn't giving him exactly the results he was looking for, so he got a uh, AUX by uh, Universal Audio. And so, since he had the AUX, he didn't feel the need initially to have master volumes in these amps, because he was going to be doing all the work uh, just into the AUX, so the level didn't really matter. But he started thinking about it, and he didn't want to have to bring the AUX out with him when he played live. So he asked if I would install master volumes in this blonde and in the uh, handwired AC30 I did for him. And I said, I'd be glad to. So that's what I've started here. Um, I'm putting it right here. Can you see this in the video? Let's see. Yeah. I am mean, installing it right here. Now on the other side of this, of this uh, chassis was this red mercury magnetics uh, label. I've got some more of these. I can put one on down here after we get the, the master volume installed. But it had that stick em. I've got to get the rest of that off. So uh, I pried it up with some guitar picks and some alcohol. And uh, then I left some goo gone on the chassis, hopefully to get all that stick em off, and let it sit while I had lunch. And let me report that it has gotten about 80% of it off, so it's going to take another application. This stuff is wonderful for things like this. And once I get all the stick them off with the goo gone, I'll just hit that part of the chassis with a uh, with an isopropyl to get all the goo gone off, and we'll have clean bare metal. Acetone works really well for that kind of thing too, but I'm always hesitant to get out the acetone because it would eat through plastic components like this, you know. And some guys use brake cleaner for similar things. And again, you have to be careful, uh, A, that it doesn't harm any plastics, and B, that stuff is toxic as hell. If I use brake cleaner, it's, it's an outside spray in the driveway on a windy day kind of project. So I'm gonna let that sit for a bit and um, plan what I'm going to do next. Now, when I had this amp in the first time, or when, you know, it's been here, but last time I worked on it, I had to replace the grid wires going from here to the octal sockets because um, it did not have the 1.5K grid stoppers. And so I ran new wires, red and yellow, like on the originals, to over here. But uh, I, I don't think this red one will reach from here to here, but I think this red one will reach from here to here. So I think I'm going to keep these red and yellow wires as the connections to the wiper on the new pot, which means I need to disconnect them here and see if uh, that buys us enough slack to do that and not run new wires beneath the board. So I've got to lift up the board in that area from the other side. This is always fun fishing things in and out of old islets. All right. Let me get some of that solder out of the way.
That one came out a lot better than the first one. wires around. I'm trying to decide whether it's going to be better to go over or under the secondary connections to the output jacks. I think under would be better. So let me do one for V6 first. And uh, I'm not overly concerned with these grid wires picking up any noise or crosstalk or anything from the stuff around them because for the majority of their length they're going to be run very close to each other and uh, any noise one picks up will be picked up by the other and they're out of phase with each other so that noise is common and will be cancelled. Let's see if I can do this one the same. I see a lot of guys using shielded wire for such a master volume installation, and I, I certainly have done it myself, and there's nothing wrong with it, but it's oftentimes not really, really necessary just because of the nature of uh, long tail pair phase inverter outputs. They want to cancel any noise for you. Right, stick them on the back. It's being obnoxious, helping it out with my thumbnail. Really gummy. I know you can't see what I'm doing, but trust me, this, this is pretty boring stuff. I'm just pushing the gummy stuff around with the back of my thumbnail. My thumbnail cannot scratch the chassis, but it can get through the stick -em. Remaining stickum's got a lot more surface area, so I'll give it a bit more goo gone and let it sit for a while. Well, I'll go back and look at the next thing. So we're going to have a master volume pot added here. The red and the yellow here going to the grids of pins uh, five and six are in place. I need to have new wires coming from here, and I need to remove these 220k grid leaks. So I think the best way for me to do that without potentially burning these Sozo caps is for me to lift the cap out at this end. If I can. Feels like they whoever built this did a crimp on the other, on the underside, which is Usually, usually a very laudable thing to do. So. In this case, it's uh, a bit inconvenient. And it's certainly more than Fender ever did. But my challenge is to disconnect these two 
resistors here without hitting either of these caps with the iron and uh, burning them or getting a little bit of a melt in there. To that end, let me find where my blue painter's tape is. Well, I've got a whole roll of this stuff floating around here somewhere, but I can't find it at the moment. This will work. These little scraps I had laying around. Just a little bit of extra protection for the cat bodies, right where I'm going to be desoldering and then soldering. I'm very good at playing operation, which is, you know, but uh, every little bit counts. And neatness definitely does count. Come on. Now, hopefully, the builder has some wire in there that I just can't see, and it's at an angle over that eyelet, not just floating in there. Because I hope it has not come out for that ground wire. If it has, I can fish it back. Okay, good, it's still there. All right. So I'm gonna have my ground wire coming here to the pot, and that'll uh, be the lug one connection on each of these. And then we'll have the two grids going to lug three on each side of the dual pot. So let me get some wire and get some lengths calculated. So I got my right one, and my left one, and my bias. And I think rather than fishing through this hole down below, I'm going to do all three on top braided together. Yeah, that way it'll be very clear to the next tech what's going on, and it'll be relatively easy to put back together. There's what Leo did, and there's what's pragmatic when the circuit changes a little bit like this. Before, when I just had to replace those wires, I ran them beneath the board like it would have been in 1962, whatever, because it's nice and I could do it. But when you have a more complicated circuit like this, and you may need to surface it at some point, better, I think, to draw out in the open. All right, so I'm just going to prep the wires at the strip off at the ends. And here it is. Now, due to the nature of this board layout, not a single one of these will be as mechanically as connect, uh, mechanically solid as I might prefer, though I will do my best to add a little bit. But because they're all three going to be running together, I will be able to braid them so they will 
support each other to a large extent. Let's see if I can get in here the tool. Just a little bit of a hook. Better. It's better. I better do the blue one next. Thank you, little bits of painter to state. You've served me well. trick with these eyelets is you want to make sure that they are filled, but you don't want it just an endless feed of solder because it will pull up beneath the eyelet between the two boards and then you have problems and clumps break off. So I'm going to braid this. Not braid it really. I've done actual braids where there's a three and four strands of one more pattern. And it's pretty. Pain in the butt. After look up how to do it each time and it's really not that necessary electronically. But this will be very strong and they'll support each other. And this bias, the blue, technically I should probably should have used violet for the bias, but didn't find any when I looked, is better than ground as far as shielding goes. So now that, I can fish it away from those heaters like that, and plenty of length for the pot. So let me see where I'm at as far as removing all that old stickum. Notice that I've been able to do about 75% of the actual wiring changes for this master volume installation faster than I've been able to get this stick them off the chassis just because someone randomly put that stick on label right where I needed to, to put in a pot. Still a little bit left. Uh, roughing up the gummy stuff with my remaining gummy stuff with my thumbnail. And I'll let another application of food gone. Alright, I'm gonna let that sit for about 15 minutes and I'll come back to it. Alright, about 15 minutes later. Yeah, the rest of that adhesive goes away as if by magic. Now I need to make sure I have all the goo gone off that area. A little ISO will do that just fine. All right, now I've got a nice clean bit of aluminum ready to, to accept the uh, new pot, which is going to go right here, 
and I'm just eyeballing it to make sure when I drill in here that nothing's going to hit any of these wires. So I'm going to kind of pull the heater wires up a little bit and I'm going to move these wires on my way for right now. All right. I debated whether to show this whole process on here, but honestly, it's a pain in the butt moving the camera back and forth for different things. A little bit of goo gone drip down there. And uh, those who know how to do this will just say, yep. And those who are who don't know how to do this probably shouldn't learn just from one YouTube video. And you guys in the middle who have some experience from this will probably get enough out of it verbally. Now this is an aluminum, ch an aluminum chassis. So it is not nearly as difficult to work on as a steel chassis. And I have these eighth inch bits and I, I re replace them every couple of months. Uh, solid, no flex to them, very sharp tips. So I don't have to center punch, though I could. And I start at a very high torque, low speed. And once I make my center point, which is going to be right about here, I press in and I start backwards. That gets it some grip. Then I go forward. Now I've got the chassis upside down at this point so that any little bits of metal that fall out fall down out of the chassis rather than into the chassis. So now I've got that in there. I go to my higher speed setting and I'm using my left hand thumbnail to make sure that if any shavings ride up the, uh, the uh, bit, they're not rotating and scoring and marking the uh, chassis in this area. And we're through, no big deal. Aluminum drills out just about the same as wood if you have a sharp bit and the right amount of torque. Now I'm changing to a stepped bit, also called a unibit. And again, I replace these about every six months. It's probably possible to sharpen them, but it's a pain in the butt. So I just get a nice new sharp one every six months or so. Just take this out to three eighths and I've got two more to go. It goes a little bit slower at this point. All right, one more to go. I'm gonna slow down. Again, with my thumbnail, keep any shavings from scarring anything. And I'm through. It should be nice and clean on both sides. If there's any roughness on the other side, I will be able to get a uh, deburring tool in there and clean up real nicely. And all those little giblets were trapped on this paper towel and fell out. Uh, might be some on this top lip here. Yeah, a few. Again, I want them to fall down into the trash can, not go random stray places inside the chassis ready to short anything out. Oh, something I want to do on this. I meant to do it before. Got this pretty uh, mercury power transformer in here with a red uh, bell cover. And I just like to put a little paper towel between the bell cover and my work surface because my work surface, that cutting mat you see in some new videos, always ends up getting uh, little giblets and stuff on it. I don't want to scratch up the paint on that transformer. Okay, I'm feeling the inside hole. And there's no rough edges. I don't need to deburr. If you feel anything at all sharp, get in there with a deburring tool, which looks like this. And just rotates around on the inside and takes off that rough inner lip. And you can get these for steel and aluminum and stuff. I think this is steel on it. For some reason, if, if it uh, works on, on steel, it'll do aluminum just fine. So you have a nice clean hole there. And... Uh, 
did it on the line of the jacks, which are a little bit higher than center on this. Let's see if I need to, yeah, I'm gonna mount it like that so we're not in danger of shorting against the chassis. Or maybe I'll mount it like that. That'll be just fine. So let me prep this first. I've got to do the uh, common connection here and some resistors. The 2 mag resistor across the 250K pot makes these uh, into uh, 220K pots rather than the 250. Just like the 220K resistors I pulled out. And it also means that should either section of this pot fail, there will still be a bias reference through that resistor, even if the pot uh, loses conductivity. Yeah, the amp won't sound very good with a very cold bias like that, but it will it will keep working. It will blow up. So let me uh, get this thing prepped. Let's start with a little bit of bus wire. I don't know how much of this you can see. Sorry if, if it's off camera. I just don't have time to stop and check focus and all that every time. It's a dual gain 250K uh, audio taper pot with a 3 8 inch bushing as opposed to the metric. The metric ones I could have used because I'm drilling the hole myself, so I didn't have to go to the full 3 8 but the metric ones have a uh, less high quality metal for the bushing itself. And they like to strip in my experience. So I'm crimping this one. And then I'll crimp this one as well. I like to get them kind of on the same plane. I'll crimp this one by like this. allows me to. So there'll be room to attach that wire as well and room for the uh, resistor leads. So get that crimp. All right now that's not going to go anywhere. This would actually work before I even solder it and that's the goal of all these things. So let me get those resistors and we'll be ready to start wiring it up. All right. And again, this is from wiper to lug one. So in the event of the pot failing, the tube does not lose bias and uh, makes the taper 220K when on 10 and makes the value 220K rather when it's on 10. So uh, it's uh, indistinguishable from stock when it's on 10. And it's not too far off even as you turn it down, as far as high pass filters go. And this is usually pretty easy to do, but because I'm trying to do this on camera, I'm messing it up. Because, you know, nothing ever goes right when you're trying to show how easy something is. And this has very little mass on it. And while it's crucial, it doesn't need uh, Anything too heavy duty to stay in place. Because it just does, it doesn't have any mass. There's not going to be any strain on it whatsoever. With that said, I'll give this one a little bit of a crimp to help it out. And the same thing on this other lug. A bit later in this video, I'll be showing the same process on that AC30 hand wired. And uh, since a lot of it will be the same stuff, I'm just going to show places where the AC30 is different from this base one. So it's not just the same information over and over again.
All right. Now, I've already taken the little tab off this, so this will go up against here. And I've got my red and yellow going to the grid here, which means I've got some excess. So let me eyeball all this. All right, just from the this bank felt yellow. And this bank red. It's very important that you have your grids always going the same, you know, consistent sides of the from Faisenberger to uh, uh, output tube, because otherwise, if you get it flipped around, you may not realize it, but you're going to be introducing uh, lots of noise and oscillation issues if you get the polarity wrong. Let's see, let me move that out of the way. I think this is going to be just the right amount of slack. You always want to have a little bit of slack on this. You want everything to be neat, nothing in excess, but slack keeps things from having strain on it. Uh, in the AC30, it's not as critical which side goes where because there's no negative feedback. But in a basement or other amp, the negative feedback, you do not want to mix up your grids. All right, so we're going to do red here, yellow here. Some mechanical support before I solder that. I hope you can see this. I hope it's not just going into blurry world. But you know, as I mentioned before, I'm now a YouTube channel who also fixes amps, or rather, it, the purpose of fixing the amps is not so that I have something to put on YouTube. YouTube is supporting the actual amp work. So when I need to make a decision whether to focus on the video or focus on the work, the work's going to win. All right, so I'm going to approach this like this. Bias. In this amp, it's bias in the uh, AC30, just kind of ground. So I do like me have some mechanical support there. Okay, there's that. I guess I'll do the yellow next here. The white for connection. Get some mechanical bends in there. Close quarters on this one. There we go. And just a little one remaining. Connection in here. Let's see. I have a little thing of star washers, of tooth washers right here the other day. And now, of course, I don't see them. Let me see where they went. Got one. Get 
this in here. Make sure that all the wire is cooperative. It is very neat. Let's get a washer out here. And the nut. Start it by hand. Now I'll make sure that's real tight without pushing up against the chassis here. I don't want this thing to rotate on me. Oh, here it is. All right, that is tight. And I uh, got a knob to match the, the stock ones. It's not really my preference. I uh, would prefer usually to do a knob like this where you can feel it. But this amp has got so much vintage stuff going for it. You'll certainly hear where, it, where it's at. I don't think anyone's gonna say, in this case, it's too subtle a difference. You just you turn it till it's the volume you want. If it was uh, just using the normal channel on this, I don't know how necessary it would be, but the quote base channel on this has got so much gain that a master can be very necessary if you use this anywhere outside of a studio or a stadium. Let's see where it's at as far as my old clocks go. A little bit less counterclockwise. screwdriver and it's too small. I don't want to damage the screw. Now a little bit more clockwise and a little bit farther out. It's just resting on the bushing too much. Resting on the nut too much. It has too much physical resistance. There we go. That's about seven, five o'clock. Uh, a little bit, a little bit more towards five, a little bit towards seven. Right? There we go. All right, let's test this and make sure it's working. Make sure I don't have any. Okay, good. There's no debris in there. And uh, Do a quick fire up and see how it's working and make sure that the range of the uh, presence is still good. It should be good from 10 o'clock up on the master volume. Below 10 o'clock, the presence will do a little bit less. That's just the nature of the beast. If I could do a better Scotty impression, this is where I'd do that. I kind of change the laws of physics. Bowl. All right. I went through down some side roads on this and I'm not sure how much of the side roads I'm going to show in testing this. Um, I don't want it to be too long, but we had some noise that turned out to be the old Brimars that the owner has in here. and He can change his out for whatever he likes. Uh, none of the noise was related to the master volume. And I just discovered that the volume pot in this strat has gotten noisy. And that can happen. Um, not so bad right now. That can happen um, when these guitars are subjected to leaking DC and old amps. You know, I use my guitars in the amps as they come in, and sometimes there's enough DC leaking. I think it it shortens the life of my volume pots. <laughs> It's working really well. And the presence doesn't really stop working until you're down just below nine o'clock, at which point you're at this level with 
uh, a lot of gain on the preamp. <laughs> level where you'd actually use this on a gig, say down to 10 o'clock on this master volume, the presence is still working. So I'm pleased with that. Both channels sound good. I'm going to let the owner know he needs to play around with some different preamp tubes in this. But uh, as far as my responsibility goes, the inside of this, I'm very happy with it. And, you know, there are people who might say that this doesn't look right to them. They, 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 want, they want to see everything in here with shielded wires from here to here, from here to here. And I got to say, mechanically, this is very reliable, all three supporting each other. And electronically, this is very quiet because of common mode cancellation. Uh, you're not going to get any benefit uh, going to shielded wire from this. Because the only thing that really would be putting noise on it would either be... Uh, the heaters or possible bleed from the secondaries on the output transformer, but uh, again, or the or the negative feedback. Uh, but again, common mode cancellation is our friend here, and I'm very confident that this is a uh, good sounding, reliable implementation. Now to do the AC30. All right, on the AC30 hand wired, the process is much the same as on that basement. Though this is cathode bias versus the fixed bias. Uh, the main consideration off the bat is that the master volume and its bypass switch and the uh, cut circuit are all connected to the same area of the board. And I need to confirm where these wires are going really fast. So let me pull this board up and lift it up and take a peek underneath. Actually, come to think of it, I may not need to peek. So I know I'm going to remove these jumpers that used to have 10K resistors across them. In the stock form, they do a separation between the cut and the master volume cross line. So there's less interaction with cut and master volume as it's turned down. But in our case, with this uh, improved post-phase inverter master volume, that shouldn't be necessary. I'll get my meter and confirm where all these wires are attached and see which, which ones I need to remove or repurpose. So if I'm lucky, the uh, cut will be connected to these two. All right, so cuts on these two which hopefully means that my master volume connections are, are these wires. Great. And you can see if blue stays with blue and brown stays with red or vice versa. So that's something I need to really know ahead of time. even though I don't have negative feedback here. So technically, it doesn't really matter if I were to reverse the grids. Best practice is to not let that happen. So on the cut, I've got a red wire, which I believe is going here. All right, like I said before, I'm not gonna be showing the stuff that's exactly the same between this and the basement, because otherwise it's just the world's longest repetitive video. So, a short while ago, I showed which was red and which was blue and which was brown, and now I don't recall what that is. Though I think I remember. I believe this one was red. And this one is brown. Correct. All right. So, given the lengths of wire that are here, 
to make this one brown slash red. Blue. Get this to go in there. I know you can't see this, but moving the camera for setup shots is just I don't have the time for it today. And there's nothing noisy really in this area. Plus, see common mode cancellation as discussed. So. Just tuck this down, get the chassis out of the way. All right, that went down a good long ways. Got the solder around it sank as well, so keep on a bit more to make sure it's solid inside. And we'll do the same for this blue connection. And the previous fender, I used red and yellow because those are the fender grid colors. This one had red and blue, so I'm maintaining that. And in the fender, I used blue for the bias, though I did mention I probably technically should have used uh, violet. But in this, I'm going to use black because instead of a bias reference, it is a ground reference that they use. Twist these together. See how I'm doing on the length. A little bit more. A little bit less. That will be good. So now I do my black. Saw it in here just nice and pretty. Those are the only connections on the underside. And again, here this is ground on both sides. And I'm going to connect the wire to the one on the left. The one on the right has got a bit of old lead metal <coughs> resistor in it. And it's not worth fishing it out right now since we're not really using it. That's very solid. And they will reinforce each other along their way. It goes there. Fresh solder added to it. So red.
that should be nice and solid. And start with it on 10. And at 10, that should be electronically and sonically interchangeable with stock. So even at very low master volume settings, the cut still works. Fucking real low. So no need for those 10K resistors between stages with this circuit. And on 10, back together and then show one more bit all right put the owner's request this vox and this blondie both got little tags that say that I have transmogrified them that deluxe reverb in the background's got one as well though i will never again put it up at the top right i think it looks cluttered so bottom right from now on though i'm going to come up with a, a better way to do this in the future it's Many great ideas. Uh, don't have the money to execute all of them as, as I'd like, but uh, this is not a vanity thing. Uh, the owner asked for these in each case, and I would not do this on an amp that I just did regular work to. This is where I have gone in and made substantive, substantive changes so that it is not, uh, it no longer does what it says on the tin, so to speak. And if someone were to, see this for sale somewhere, they would know uh, that I indeed did the work. But again, it's discreet. It's not a screaming kind of thing. And if the owner tires of it or chooses not to like it, it's just two screws and two very, very tiny holes in the grill cloth and they're gone. 